I want to welcome everyone to today's Soul Repair Center webinar, Veteran Writing Groups, a resource for healing from moral injury. I'm Nancy Ramsey, Director of the Soul Repair Center at Bright Divinity School on the campus of TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. The center provides resources for religious leaders and professional caregivers who support veterans and their families affected by moral injury. Our mission includes offering monthly webinars that further that mission with a focus on topics that have been inadequately covered or not covered at, at all. We're grateful for the support of the Shea Center on Moral Injury at Volunteers of America, which co-sponsors these webinars. That center is directed by Dr. Rita Nakashima Brock, Senior Vice President at VOA and co-founder of the Soul Repair Center. Today, our panelists include veterans shaped by different generations, two have combat experience while another service was within the United States and also in the reserves. Each will share with us ways writing groups are a resource for living with their experience of moral injury. They bring experience in founding and are participating in writing groups and also uh, for that include veterans as well as family members. And these are persons who have experienced the consequences of military uh, moral injury in their service. Dr. H.C. Palmer is a retired internist who served as battalion surgeon with the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam, 1965 to 1966. After his service in Vietnam, he and other veterans began to share the ways they found writing was facilitating healing from the trauma of war. H.C. has directed the writing team for nine years in partnership with the Kansas City Public Libraries and the Moral Injury Association of America. He is a widely published poet whose work appears in numerous journals and anthologies. In 2017, he published his first book of poetry, Feet of the Messenger, which was recognized as a 2017 Kansas notable book. Ron Capps is the founder and director of the Veterans Writing Project, a 501c3 nonprofit that provides no cost creative writing and songwriting workshops for veterans and their family members. He has also developed various curricula for expressive writing for veterans and family members that are used in academic and therapeutic contexts, including the National Endowment for the Arts and Walter Reed Hospital. Ron also founded a literary journal for veterans now in its ninth volume. A combat veteran, Ron served in the Army and Army Reserve for 25 years and is also a retired foreign service officer. His memoir, Seriously Not All Right, Five Wars in 10 Years, documents his service in Rwanda, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Darfur, as well as his struggle with war-related PTSD and moral injury. Dr. Sid Jacobs is a veteran, sociologist, poet, and former professor of sociology at Widener University in Chester, Pennsylvania. He served 13 years in military service in the US, which also included service in the reserves. Professor Jacobs is a member of the Interfaith Veterans Work Group in Wilmington, Delaware. In 2020, Sid published his first book entitled Freedom Poems, Poems to Live, Love, Fight, Die, and Resurrect By. He is a keynote speaker and recites his poetry around the world. Our webinar will proceed with presentations of approximately 15 minutes by each of the three panelists. Then I will moderate an opportunity for them to engage each other in conversation. In the last 30 minutes, I will share questions you post in the chat and invite their responses. Our chat monitor is Kyle Fauntleroy, a development officer at Bright and a retired captain in the US Navy Chaplain Corps. Kyle is a founding member of the Soul Repair Center National Advisory Board, and he will forward your questions uh, for the panelists to me. I'm also grateful to Sam McAllister on the staff at VOA who is managing this production. Please remember that all our webinars are posted as links on this website and at the VOA YouTube channel. Ordinarily, the link for a webinar is available after 10 business days. Now let's give our attention to our panelists, beginning with H.C. Palmer. Hi, 
Uh, my name is H.C. Palmer. I'm 85 years old and a retired physician. I'm a poet and a fiction writer. I was a battalion surgeon with the 1st Infantry Division during the American War in Vietnam. I want to tell you about our program here in Kansas City. We're now in our 10th year. And uh, so I'm going to start by telling you my personal background and then work up to where we are today. Uh, I'm going to tell you about how I started writing and what led to the formation and sustaining of this Kansas City Veterans Writers Team, as we call it. Then I'll tell you why I believe our team works and how and why we've maintained and I think even expanded and strengthened our team's role in the veteran writers community. In 1964, I was one of 1,500 physicians drafted from medical residency training. My best friend, also a physician and a classmate, was drafted at the same time. I went to Fort Riley to be with the 1st Infantry Division, and he joined the Rangers and then the 5th Special Forces. One year later, the summer of 1965, we were both treating battlefield casualties in South Vietnam. About three months after our discharge, we were together in Scottsdale, Arizona and standing on the corner, not uh, Winslow, but Scottsdale, uh, uh, Lincoln Boulevard and Scottsdale Boulevard, when we heard from behind us the undeniable rotor slaps of a Huey helicopter. Without thinking, we both hit the sidewalk right on the curb and a woman next to us screamed and jumped aside. We stood up and brushed ourselves off and apologized. We didn't say anything more about that incident until dinner that night when we agreed that we had at least one serious problem and speculated what else might be inside our heads and hearts from the war in Vietnam. A few years after the war, Viking Penguin Press published my friend's first Vietnam War novel. And that book was my inspiration to write because I wasn't going to let him get ahead of me with anything. So over the next 50 years, we've shared hundreds of conversations about our own writing, about the American war in Vietnam and other wars in our lifetimes. My friend had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his expert medical care and bravery at the Battle of Play Me. His horrific combat encounters haunted him terribly and for many years, but as he, as he continued to write, and as I began writing about my own war experiences, we started dialogues, or you could say friendly critiques. And when we did that, we discovered we were negotiating our own stories with each other's help. We were two veterans in an undeclared workshop, sharing and critiquing each other's work. In 2008, the National Endowment for the Arts started a nationwide program to encourage veteran writing groups with seminars scheduled across the country led by terrific war writers like Tobias Wolf, Tim O'Brien, and Carl Marlantis. Somehow, we never connected with the NEA, but that image of a group of veterans writing together stayed with me. Then in 2012, I attended a soul repair conference at Bright Divinity School. There I met Dr. Rita Brock and Jonathan Shea. I'd not yet read Dr. Brock's wonderful book, but I had read Shea's Achilles in Vietnam and it had changed my life. I invited uh, Dr. Brock to a Veterans Day dinner at our very large church in Kansas City. Over 500 people attended. There was a lot of excitement after Brock's, Dr. Brock's program and that very night, two of us, um, pledged that we would start a veterans writers group of some kind. It seem, seemed it would be by default, the church based, um, based in the church where we were going, but the program did not include writing about war experiences and storytelling. About a year later, two of us on the team who were writers decided to join a community writers place and the Kansas City Public Library to focus on poetry and fiction and nonfiction as a way of storytelling recalling the National Endowment of the Arts blueprint. Our team's now in our 10th year and we've altered our mission and goals several times, many times. We've learned early on that we had to be flexible to survive. One thing in particular, we decided it best to invite family members of veterans to be a part of our writers group. We partnered 
early on with the World War I Museum for our first public workshop. Over 40 people attended. Since then, we've received support from the Missouri Humanities and the Missouri Arts Council, Volunteers of America, the VFW, the Moral Injury Association of America. And we've worked with the Kansas City Writers Place and the Kansas City Public Libraries in both Kansas and Missouri. Obviously, we've been flexible for our mission to help our veterans and family members to help them tell their stories in the best way possible. I believe because of our willingness to morph and move in different directions, we've survived. So here's where we are now. This is how we stand in 2022 with our Kansas City Veteran Writing Team teams, uh, rules and regulations, you might say. We have a group of five team leaders that organize and oversee our meetings and workshops. Two of our team leaders are writers and poets, one a combat veteran and the other an accomplished writer and professor whose father served in World War II and was killed in action in Korea. Her husband is a Vietnam vet. We have some rules to go by. We do not require our writing team members to be veterans or fan. We do require our writing team members to be veterans or family members of veterans. Briefly, our process for monthly team workshops is to submit 500 word pieces a week ahead of time. And these are emailed to the group at the workshop. Everybody's already read everybody else's piece. And with good manners, we critique each piece. Then the two professional writers critique and then the author comments. The author is not allowed to comment during the previous comments. And the pieces can usually be in our rework for the next session. And this has been a very successful formula or recipe for us. Our team's focus is writing. Our goal is to write our very best and for our writers who wish to be able to tell their stories truly. We have no intentions of trying to diagnose or treat PSD or moral injury. By the way, we do estimate those, as, those of us who've been with the program since the beginning that about one third of our team has had PTSD or moral injury. Many of our members never write about war at all, but that's okay. And so, because one day they pop up and all of a sudden they're bringing a little war story or a story of their son or their mother or father. Um, we hope some of their stories and poems will make it to a publisher. If the writer wishes that, we help them all we can. Importantly, our members are not required to write about war. They may write about anything they wish. We have extended workshops in the spring and fall with guest writers and poets. On two occasions, we've been able to partner with other groups in town when Tim O'Brien and Carl Marlantis were here. This fall, We'll have a two-day workshop. Our guest presenters are Dr. Rita Nakashima Brock and retired Colonel Thomas McGuire, the editor of Lit War Literature and the Arts, the literary journal of the United States Air Force Academy. A couple of more things. Workshop attendance is required to remain a member of our team. And before becoming a member of our team, one must have attended at least one spring or fall workshop uh, and then we observe them during that time. And sometimes we're pretty close while we're observing and there's some people by their actions, we ask them not to become a member. We believe true war stories take a very long time to tell. Inexperienced writers haven't learned to compose syntactically or meaningfully. And until they've done that, they don't have the tools to tell their stories to others. And most importantly, they don't have the tools to tell the stories to themselves. In our group, we strive to learn to write clearly, compellingly, and convincingly. The payoff is this. Good writing skills instruct good thinking. In other words, the processing of our thoughts. This helps us understand where we are with our own war. Helps us to find a path to recovery. Another way to say this is better stories help us to learn to negotiate our brokenness. Thank you, HC. Now let's turn to uh, Ron Caps.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, and thanks, HC. That was really terrific. Um, I want to sort of preface what I'm going to say this afternoon with some background on the Veterans Writing Project. As Nancy said, we're a 501c3 uh, that provides no-cost creative writing and songwriting workshops for veterans and their family members. Um, I founded the organization in 2011, and so far we have brought our workshops to 25 states and had more than 3,600 people come through. Uh, the, the various programs that we run. We're also a publishing organization. Our literary journal, ODARK30, publishes fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and short plays quarterly in print and regularly, but somewhat less predictably, um, online. All of our instructors meet the same set of criteria. They're your working writer with a graduate writing degree and a veteran. And we have men and women. We have old gray haired retirees like me and people who serve one tour. So it's a, it's, 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 it's a good broad um, scope of veterans. Um, we work with partners and sponsors to fund our programs around the country. We've worked with sponsors ranging from huge organizations like the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs to the National Endowment for the Arts. HC mentioned uh, the Operation Homecoming program. Um, I'm going to talk about our role in this, the follow-on to that, which is also called Operation Homecoming, um, but it, it began in about 2011. Um, National Endowment for the Arts, so state and local humanities and arts commissions, colleges, universities, veteran services organizations, um, advocacy groups, hospitals and mental health clinics, city and county councils, community arts centers, public libraries even. And then we, we've had a couple of private individuals fund uh, workshops for us to come out to their town and set things up. Um, <clears throat> early on, Nancy asked me to talk about uh, curriculum and the different curricula that we use. So um, let me start with our standard creative writing curriculum. It's called Writing War, A Guide to Telling Your Story. I had a copy. There it is. I had a copy around here. Writing War, A Guide to Telling Your Story. It's um, what we've used in all of our workshops across the spectrum. Um, sometimes we have an additional curriculum that we start with, but this is given to all of our, all of our participants in our workshops. Um, it is a craft-based curriculum, which to us means that it, it works across the genres, poet, playwright, fiction writer, memoirist, essayist, it doesn't matter because the elements of the craft, in our view, the elements of the craft remain the same. So we focus on Elements like scene setting, dialogue, narrative structure, plot, point of view. Um, we also look at actions that writers take, like getting into a story, starting beginnings of stories and endings of stories. And then we talk about revision, which is what most writers spend almost all their time doing anyway. Uh, the last two chapters in the book are called Writing About Trauma and Your New Life as a Writer. And Your, your New Life as a Writer is basically a look at how to find your best pathway to writing. Are you a person that can write, that needs a lot of chaos around them to write? Go to your Starbucks and, and hang out. If you're a person like me that needs absolute quiet, um, you, you know what you've got to do. And then we talk about what some, some other writing instructors have talked about for generations in uh, just finding your own path. Um, we talk about getting your work published as well. With writing about trauma, um, the very first thing I note is that I'm not a medical professional and that everything I'm talking about in, in that chapter is just from my personal experience. Um, I talk about my path home from war and how writing helped me get past a lot of trauma. Um, focusing on one idea really, I think, is that either you control the memory or the memory controls you. And when that idea came to me, I, I quite literally hand wrote it down on a piece of paper and tacked it up on the wall next to my computer so that I could look at it every day while I was writing. And what struck me about it is that as long as those traumatic memories are in my head, they're in control of me. They can come at any time they want. They, they can just sort of take control of my life. But once they're out, once they're out on a piece of paper, I can write it down. I can shape it. I can form it. I can destroy it. I can tear it up. I can burn it. I can throw it away and I can have a little more control over that memory. And so this is one of my guiding principles when I was writing my memoir, 
um, and, and essays and some of the other stuff that I've done. Um, I also talk in that chapter a little bit about what I learned doing research while I was creating another curriculum. And that curriculum was for the National Endowment for the Arts um, program called Operation Homecoming. Uh, the second phase of that was with the National Endowment for the Arts and the Department of Defense. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. The research for that curriculum, I started with a guy named Jamie Pennebaker, Dr. James Pennebaker from uh, the University of Texas. And Jamie's kind of the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of writing as therapy. He got started as a graduate student researching how people who have suffered trauma can use writing as a way of getting control of it. And his research is published both in medical journals and in sort of layman's books. And I started with the layman's books and then I had him explain, explain the medical stuff to me and I had a lot of help. Um, I also talked with a guy named Robert Sapolsky, Dr. Robert Sapolsky out at um, Stanford and with Jonathan Shea, who I'm sure you're all familiar with from the Boston VA. Shea and Sapolsky are, of course, are MacArthur Grant recipients, and Shea's books, um, Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus in America, really are, I think, seminal works in the study of and treatment of moral injury. Um, another person I talked to was Dr. Ron Koshis. Ron's a retired Army Medical Corps psychiatrist, former president of the Society of American military psychiatrist and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. He treated me when I came home from my second tour in Darfur after a, I was medevaced out after a failed suicide attempt. Um, he sits on the, pro, the board of directors of, of my project, the Veterans Writing Project as well. And I, I'm, I'm telling you about all these people for a specific reason. I want to impress you with the level of advice I was offered, the people that I was offered contact with just to get this project started for the National Endowment for the Art. So this all began back in 2011, and just completely out of the blue, I got an email from, from Bill O'Brien, who was the Senior Director for Innovation at the National Endowment for the Arts. And Bill told me he'd heard about my work with the Veterans Writing Project, and he explained that NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, and DOD, Defense Department, were creating a therapeutic arts program, and they wanted to have a writing component. And over the next few weeks really, we, talk, we discussed what that might look like and then NEA commissioned me to create the curriculum. Well given that I have a handful of, crea of uh, uh, creative arts and liberal arts degrees and no background at all in science or medicine, I said I might need some help. That's when he put me in touch with Jamie Pennebaker and we were off to the races. Um, I asked Pennebaker, Shea, and Sapolsky hundreds of questions over that summer. I wrote the curriculum in the fall. And around Thanksgiving, we ran it through IRB's uh, institutional review boards at the National Institute of Health, Walter Reed Institute of Research, um, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And I mean, who knew that the NEA could pull together an IRB? Um, we debuted this program in January 2012. The point here is that, one, this was a policy priority for the United States government or we would never have been able to move this quickly. Um, and two, it was a real matter of interest to the medical and the arts communities, or I would never have gotten access to the scientists that I did. But we got it done. We ran that program continuously through the end of 2020 and into early 2020, I'm sorry, through the end of 2019 and through the beginning of 2020 when COVID shut us down. Um, by that time, we were operating both at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. It's called the NICO, uh, which is the Defense Department's premier research and treatment facility for PTSD and traumatic brain injury. But we were also working at the Behavioral Health Clinic of Walter Reed, which is more, much more of a local um, facility. NICO is a national facility. Uh, wounded veterans come from all over the, the world, really. Their command send them to Walter Reed to go through a month-long program. And the writing component uh, was involved in all four weeks of that. We met with them four times. Um, and that curriculum was built around a set of prompts, writing prompts that we would offer to the participants, one for each of the four weeks that they were there. One of them was um, built around a scene from the Iliad, the, the seminal war story. In this scene, Hector, the Trojan prince and the hero of, of Troy has come up 
from the battlefield to the city of Troy, and he finds his wife Andromeda, and they're having a talk before he goes back to the battle. And during this conversation, Andromeda asks Hector why he feels that he personally must be the one to go back to the battle. Now, this war has been going on for nine years and nine months. The, the Iliad is a three-month story, but it's the last three months of a 10-year war. And so Hector is standing there after having fought a war for nine years, and he's been at the front the whole time. You know, he comes home to see his wife and kid, but he's, he's been a warrior down there for almost 10 years. And so Andromache is like, why do you have to go back? Isn't it someone else's turn? And Hector is standing inside the gates of Troy, and he's wearing his full body armor, he's got his sword, and he's got his helmet on. And these helmets, you know, they, they're face covering helmets. They've got the piece that comes like this, and then the little slot across here. And he's wearing this inside the gates of Troy. And so, and she's kind of getting in this question over and over again, trying to get him to give her an answer that she'll accept. And, okay, let, let's face it, Hector's a guy, <laughs> He just, he, he doesn't want to have this conversation. He doesn't, he's not comfortable talking about himself or his feelings. And he feels like he's being sort of badgered or pun intended Hector. And so he reaches to take up his infant son. And the kid immediately starts screaming and crying. Hector takes off his helmet, sets it on the ground. And the kid goes, oh, da, da. And so everything's fine now. So what Homer has shown and what we tried to exploit in this with this prompt is that warriors are very much invested in their identity this is who i am this is what i do i'm good at it i'm a professional and i'm i'm the one that should be there and that's who hector is and i know that for a lot of people who were career military like i was we very much had this saw this attitude all the time uh, i never wanted to miss an opportunity to deploy. I wanted to be the guy out there on, on the front line gathering that information, turning it into intelligence and sending that back to Washington. I was an intelligence officer. Um, but Hector is so fully engaged with this identity that he forgets that his family doesn't recognize him. His child doesn't recognize him because he's wearing this mask. Once he takes it off, the family begins to recognize it. And I loved this prompt because it just brought up so many different questions and so many different stories. And because that conversation was probably going on pretty much every day in Virginia Beach, um, at Fort Bragg and at Camp Lejeune, where people were deploying for the, the 20 years of Afghanistan and the years of Iraq. Um, that was one of several prompts that we used for the four weeks that we were there. Um, and that was the uh, expressive writing curriculum that we wrote for NICO. Uh, the third curriculum I created was for our program. It's a songwriting curriculum. At, it might be a slightly of less interest because for the moment at least, it's just very much a straightforward music and songwriting program. We road tested it three times and fine tuned it a little bit each time. And we'll start to work with it on a regular basis next week when we start doing uh, regular songwriting programs here in Maine in conjunction with a venue called the Peace Gallery. Um, so over the next few months, I hope to develop that more in depth. And the, the down the road program we're working on is um, to begin to program some of our workshops in the natural environment. Uh, a few years ago, we ran a workshop with, in partnership with the Wilderness Society way out in the Dragoon Mountains of Arizona, and it, it went beautifully. And we sort of relearned what writers since Aristotle have known that being outdoors is good for your health and well-being. So we'll continue running workshops in nature to take advantage of those positive effects of being outside. Um, and before I close, just let me briefly address our approach to this. Our strategy is to come at the healing aspects of our work uh, quite indirectly, indirectly, peripherally. Um, we are writers and educators and performers it's very, we're very clear up front that we do not provide health care in our workshops. Nonetheless, we've studied the phenomena involved in using the arts as a form of healing. And we've sat in the room with creative arts therapists every week for seven or eight years, 
while badly damaged returning veterans have used the arts to help heal themselves. Personally, I've profited from the effects of using art to heal myself in my personal life. And all of us in the project have seen healing take place in and in the aftermath of our creative writing workshops. So we're believers. And just as we can come to moral injury along multiple paths, whether via commission, acts of commission or acts of omission, by having survived when others didn't, by having been betrayed by our leadership or some other path, in everything we do at the, the writing project, we, we seek to provide one, at least, of what we believe are multiple paths home, and that is the power of creating art. And that, that's what I have. Thank you. Got it. Should I go on? Yes, please proceed, Sid. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Soul Repair Center, Nancy, Rita, Sam, and then Kyle, Ron, and HC. I'm totally impressed by uh, the presentations. I'm going to go right into uh, my poetic pieces. Where's the Una? A justice supreme of the highest order ask in the midst of chaos and disorder. Where is the una? We have the pluribus, that's the many, but love for all and all for one, we haven't any. Where was the una when a Dakota farmer said, damn niggers, we need to take the asses back to Africa because he was appalled to see such a bicentennial sketch of the American Revolution mainly portrayed by blacks in freedom face. Looking all intelligent and straight laced. What a gig, tops in blue the United States Air Force, man, woman, and LGBTQ. They were rocking those white wigs too. Seemed so odd and out of place from, my, from his standpoint. Or maybe he'd listened to Richard Pryor's bicentennial nigger and couldn't help but spurt racist trigger words behind my back that day. He wanted to force us out by gunpoint, I guess, or would he want the cavalry to act on his behest like they did in the Trail of Tears, like tears for fears they wanted to rule the world. WTF, I, WTF, I, I just kept my raw emotions to myself and prayed for that cranky old white farmer. I even cried for him later on that night. Or was I weeping for myself? Pin up raw emotions laced with love, hate, and ambivalence, caught in a double consciousness. Am I African? Am I American? Am I colored? Am I Negro? Am I black? Am I real? Or am I memorex? So ambivalent and vexed. Out of that horrific fight that night came a beautiful light. It told me I am all of the above, but much, much more, because we, the people, came from a myriad of shores, bound by one love, so generous and so American. Where was the unum when a little white girl pointing at me said to her mom and daddy, mommy, he's a nigger, while eating pancakes and waffles at a Denny's in San Antonio, Texas. The unum was in my heart. I quickly surmised she only thought what she was taught. What was the unum when a KKK member up to no good tried to blow up our church and hood on an early Christmas morning, but blew himself up in his pickup truck instead? Yep, his evil transgressions killed him real dead. Where was the owner when my commanding officer said to blacks, Sid, Willard, Drew, you guys eat fried chicken and watermelon real well, but you ain't got no basketball in at a law enforcement photo shoot. Now smile at that. Maybe I should have thrown in my hat a long time ago, but to my surprise, I surmise I am protecting the good Americans as well as the racist ones, the lazy ones, the ugly ones, the tall ones and the short ones, understanding that America is the good the bad and the ugly, and therein lies its beauty. Where's the onum? It's on the one. It's in the one who sings in my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, to thee I sing. From the truest founders to the newest founders, from the slave master to the enslaved African, from the indigent servant 
to the freedmen, from the proletariat to the capitalists, black, white, blue, yellow, red, and green, and all other socially constructed colors in between. What does it mean to be free? It's in the synergy of not you nor me, but we the people struggling to be and stay free. In spite of our isms and schisms, colors and rhythms, it is what binds us that make us great. From that we must not separate nor hesitate to show love rather than hate. Until we know love, we won't pass this test. Let's be Americans at our best or our unum will end up in our anus. And that city upon the hill, so idealistic and pure will not endure, but succumb to a stylized massacre Let's keep the one swinging, America. I'd rather hear the children singing about a land of liberty rather than a land of misery or its demise from the heavenly skies. I hear it's the fire next time. I'm gonna run, go right to the next one. I wanna make sure that I get everything in. This piece is called Free, Eternity Still Ahead of Me. Thrilled to be 65. Eternity still ahead of me, always will be, flowing freely through infinity, alive, blessed to be, bundled up creativity, oppressed by the isms of society, racial PTSD, moral injury, 10 billion bolts of lightning energy, busting mental shackles of slavery like Marley, systems of oppression constraining me, but woman, no cry, fighting Goliath till I die. In the old bit, tell them I tried, I didn't lie, truth personify, and still I rise. Snap, crack, crack, pop, broken chains of misery, time release victory over his story on time from the Lord in me. Darkness cease, peace be still, a son's passion, his father's will to overcome. I give thanks to the one. I am like who I love and who loves me. I am who I am born to be free, not hanging, from a poplar tree. Shootings in the streets trigger restless cops and gang rivalry, byproducts of a conflictual society. Democrat versus Republican, capitalist versus proletariat, white versus black, old versus young, new girls versus the good old boys, upper class versus underclass, those marginalized and others in between. Squeezed by the extreme, schisms of the isms, the dismantling of a dream like COVID-19, a country to its knees, structural, Anime, flower power in a mustard seed, the heart of a tall tree, our struggle to be free, I feel like busting loose. Free, free to think for me, independently, now I see our reality. Stevie, you said it so brilliantly, living for the city, a people ghettoized by those racialized, see it in their eyes, kind of heavenized, the pain, the suffering, the joy, the laughter, purgatory, halfway there, where? Fire and ice, yearning for home, the hereafter, paradise, no despair calls, I ain't no ways tired. Destined to get there, walking through the fire, a rebirth, here on earth, a kingdom coming, we're in the running, the princess, the princesses and the princesses. King went to the mountaintop, I have a dream. He saw the future and it will be. Like Prince, I ain't gonna stop till I reach the top. More than carried my share like a beast of burden struggling to get there. Somewhere conquered the lives behind the disguise, masquerading, perpetrating, impression management, a con game, kept my core just the same. Truth, heaven sent, will have to repent for a passing grade, hard to take by one getting AIDS. A dog eat dog affair, the bougie high up there, sitting in their easy chairs while the poor gasp for air. Come with me where the air is rare. You will see it's brown down here. On the ground, money is green. What about me? What about us? Michael says, some say, quote unquote, says, rather than said, quote unquote. His lyrics aren't dead. The word can't, the word can't lie and the word won't lie. Michael ain't dead. Check him out on Jam, not a hologram. Here comes the man, hot damn. What the fuss? They don't really care about us. Political orgies on Capitol Hill, disgusting, dire, the basement's on fire. First line reactions to the structural strain. Therein lies the pain, the suffering, the, uh, the pathologies, deviance disdain by those sipping champagne. How do we gain? While suited ones sit on the hill, ignoring our pain. Gonna take more than a stimulus bill. 
the spirit of the people they can't kill. God's will to eradicate disparities between the rich and the rest of us. The oligarchy must pony up. Putting my dreams on, on hold, watching dreamers reach their goals, having nightmares in the ghetto, be patient is what I'm told. Heresy is what I see. Lights out on my American dream, down here where the air is rare, stifling, trifling, suffocating, debilitating. Eric Garner couldn't breathe. He was killed by the police for setting looses on the street. George Floyd with a knee on his neck echoed Eric's desperate plea, please, 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 I can't breathe. My stomach hurts, my neck hurts, please, please, I can't breathe. Life null and voice, deceased due to police brutality. Oh, mercy, mercy me, my sweet Lord. What have we come to be when animals are treated better than we, the people of such a storied history, stifling, trifling, suffocating, debilitating, stony the road we tried. Lord, why do they make it so hard? Brothers and sisters can't breathe, suffering with racial battle fatigue, sisters especially, they too strangled by the grief. I can't be walking, I can't be the walking dead. I took the gun from my head, decided to do good deeds instead. Even got a little aged, like a fine Merlot, I'm bold and beautiful, wiser than a sage, wages paid, saved. Having beat the purple haze of blessed child, buck wild, transgressions of my youthful days. Spent time on the planet, but I ain't done them. Bigger than COVID, I still have a dream. Bigger than COVID-19, I repent. I rise even after the moment I die, believing in the Christ in me, birth of the, of the blues in me, the cool in me, besting the fool in me, navigating the stratified waters of society intelligently, negotiating isms with sobriety, triumphantly through agape. Finally, yet timely, I live to tell the story. My father gets the glory, sweet, sweet release. I'm free, eternity still ahead of me. Okay. Last one here. I want to pick it up a little bit and give praise to the Father. God be with you. If God is with you, then who stands against you? No man, no woman, nothing, no one, not the sun, not the moon, not the stars. They perform a celestial concert on your behalf. Humble by the awesome of God's power, tamed by his infinite intelligence. The maestro directs you along the way. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What a concert, what a blessing. Rejoice, sing his praises. Thank you, Sid. I wonder if you'd like to reflect for, you've got a couple more minutes to reflect on what you, uh, in, what it was like for you to share these with us and to write them um, prior to our time together. Uh, you're, you're muted, Sid. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you told me that I have a couple more minutes because when I was Working on Absolutely. this earlier, yes, I, I'm like, okay, I can't keep this in, but uh, and I just want to get straight to the pieces. But nevertheless, though, it was a cathartic experience, and I, I like sharing and listening to other stories. As a social historian, I, I, I'm, my ears are, are maybe they're even better than my words, but uh, I love listening to other people tell their stories. Um, but uh, just to be around veterans, to be around people that are interested because I can tell you, uh, <laughs> going to the military, I quit college, I went to the military, uh, kind of oppressed uh, a bit, but did well in the Air Force, come to the Air National Guard and the Army Guard. And, uh, and I should say, first I should say though, that when I came home, uh, I'm just being real here, my, my family didn't think I had done much. <laughs> okay, so uh, they were not a military family, even though I grew up, uh, Around um, around Fort Fort Bragg, Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, you know, and I always wanted to go to the military, particularly the 82nd Airborne, in the eighth grade until I found out they were shooting them out of the sky. But nevertheless, though, uh, 
they didn't think I had done much. And even when I went to college, most of the people there, they didn't, at least the people that I were around, they didn't believe in God so much. Uh, and uh, they didn't think I had done much either, actually. So, and so I was caught in this double consciousness, you know, trying to find my way. And uh, poetry gave me the opportunity to kind of pull everything together uh, with sociology, with religion, God, friendship, love, that sort of thing. And so I think I've actually, by finally now kind of reading my work, publishing my work, getting my work out there, I've come full circle. Hmm. For full circle in what way? And that uh, being, uh, well, as I said, I, I, I quit college. So I kind of missed that, you know, I missed being immersed in the college experience, but I went there because I wanted to, I wanted Uncle Sam to pay for the GI Bill, pay, pay for my education on the GI Bill. And I wanted to travel, I did those things. But then when I came home, I didn't have anybody, I, I couldn't relate to anybody. Nobody understood where I had been. Um, and, uh, and so then when I went to college, once I was told that again, I would maybe be in a political science class or something like that. And I might bring up my military experience. I remember one feminist saying, look, we don't wanna hear what you have. <laughs> said but nobody's down military so just shut up and so then and i was also told that look you know uh in sociology we don't do poetry so just stop it so you know i always had to kind of compartmentalize myself and then when i uh, uh, got through academia uh and i remember being at uh, uh, a commencement ceremony and the main speaker said all those who have been in the military or serving in the military now or in ROTC or whatever. And I proudly stood up and I looked around to see all these other people standing up with me. And it was only maybe one or two other professors. And I was really shocked, but they didn't think much of my experience. And so then I really couldn't, you know, couldn't be myself, couldn't be myself. And I had actually left the military and I left my friends behind there. So I, didn't, I wasn't in contact with them. So I was kind of like in, you know, in a like a, a a space where I really couldn't relate to the fullness, and so by writing my work, uh, going back and even visiting some of the people that even oppressed me, and even telling them that I love them because I do, um, and and then getting my work out, man, and then joining the the interfaith writers workshop here in Delaware, thanks to Tom Davis and uh, Abbott Mills uh, of the uh, Twin Poets. He's a Abbott is a one of the ports laureate of Delaware and some of the other writers, Tracy Cooper, people like that. Uh, it it uh, kind of made me feel whole again. So that's where I am now. Thank you very much. Let's um, let's have the uh, the three of you and I'll join you and um, we'll have some conversation together. So Ron and HC, if you could join us, that'd be great and um, super. Let, let, yeah, that's it. Um, great. I, I want to give you all uh, a chance to, uh, and Sid, you might want to unmute yourself so you will remember when, when they respond or people ask you a question, but I'm, I'm interested. You know, first of all, I want to see if there are questions you would like to ask each other or respond to what each other might have said. Well, I, I'd like to say something quickly to uh, Ron and H.C., uh, you talked about the humanities forum. Uh, you talked about, I think, the division of the arts or something like that. And you just gave me some great ideas. I used to actually uh, work for the uh, Delaware Humanities Forum for about maybe six years part-time. And uh, I, you've actually, just by you talking here today, just gave me guidance. And it just gave me a lot of ideas about going to them and maybe getting a grant from the uh, Delaware Humanities Forum or from the Arts Council or something like that. So I appreciate that. Ron, HC, do you have any uh, comments or further reflections you'd like to share? I mean, I have questions, but I'd like to prioritize y'all's first. No, I'm still absorbing what I heard. So I'm okay. gonna just wait for somebody else to ask a question or comment. Oh, dog. This is Nellie. I'm sure Nellie is a great audience for your work. 
she's she's a little needy today sorry <laughs> One question, uh, Ron, that we had was, uh, I think you could respond to is, um, can you clarify what might differentiate um, a writing program in a clinical or therapeutic setting as some of your work has, has supported um, from the kind of um, writing groups that, um, that Sid and HC um, have been describing? That, do, that are not um, intentionally um, therapeutic. What, what's the differentiation there? Well, let me start by saying that um, in the United States, if you were a fine artist, a painter, a sculptor, an actor, a dancer, or a musician, you can go and get your Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Music degree and then go on to graduate school and study to become a music therapist, art therapist, movement, dance movement therapist, or um, drama therapist. Uh, in the US, to my knowledge, that doesn't exist. I mean, I went to grad school at Johns Hopkins and they've got a terrific writing program and a, a pretty good hospital. And people looked at me like I was crazy when I suggested that we you know, actually create a writing therapy program um, so there's no certification in the United States for, as for writing therapists. Lots of um, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists use writing in their practice, but there's no creative arts therapist who's a, who is specifically a writing person there in the room. So when the National Endowment came to me, I pointed this out. I said, I, you know, I've got a degree in English literature and um, a couple of graduate degrees, but not, I'm not a, you know, I, I don't hold a PhD in anything or, and I'm not a medical person. And what we did was sit with psychiatrists, brain scientists, psychologists, and creative arts therapists, or art, music, and dance movement therapists to think about our work, my work particularly, leading these writing workshops. Um, the difference, I think, is in that my part, my role in the uh, creative art, in the expressive writing workshops, the therapeutic writing workshops, was really to focus on the writing. I'm not qualified to do, to do medicine. And when someone would come in and they would write something that was really a little disturbing, my focus had to stay on the writing itself. What's working in this piece? Where might you make it a little bit better? And the creative arts therapist sitting on one side of me and the psychologist or psychiatrist sitting on the other side of me, the, what to do about that piece of writing, that's their issue. And I think that for, um, the, the, there was a question about setting up writing programs for um, people who are just coming out of other kinds of trauma. And, you know, again, to me, Trauma's trauma. I don't care if you were in a, a car wreck, in direct combat, uh, the victim of violence, the, there's trauma involved in all of these. And if you're trying to use writing to get control of that trauma, I really suggest that you get professional help and use writing. This is not an either or, I think it's an and proposition. But as a writer and as someone who runs writing programs, I would say you've, you've got a couple of issues. One, people have to self-select. They have to come to you. You can't just go out and start rounding people up. You know, they, they come to you, they've self-selected because they want to be a writer. They are writers, they want to do this work. That's the first problem is getting them to, in, into the room. But once you're there, just focus on the writing. Don't don't go beyond that you know how how can this piece be improved where is it working how can it be improved um and what do you intend to do with it how can we help you with that that's 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 the recommendation that i've got right hc there have been a number of, of folks interested in particular writing prompts and skills that you've given persons and i'm wondering if you'd like to talk a bit about that well, the best one we ever did was um, a 
couple of us were going to be in a meeting that summer with Tim O'Brien down at Swanee Riders Workshop. And uh, so we thought uh, in that spring that we'd ask our, everybody had read the things they carried. So we asked our writers group to imagine the, the own characters, don't change the character's name, keep the same characters and write little vignettes, perhaps anywhere from 250 to 500 words that you could just take and slip in to Tim's book and somebody might not notice that Tim hadn't written it. So that was maybe the most fun thing we did. And we had um, two people that uh, said, um, yeah, I'll take it on down to Swanee and let Tim have a look at it. And he did very, very kindly did that after everything was over, wrote a nice note on it. One of them was just spectacular. The other one was excellent. And he, uh, wrote accordingly on there and signed it. And they now have that piece of theirs on their wall and framed and signed by Tim. So, you know, that was that was a lot of fun, perhaps the most fun thing we did. But I think you could do that. Um, I think that would be a good one to do with anybody once or twice a year. You know, those, he, he, his book is, um, I was going to say a Bible. It's not a Bible, but it may be better in some ways. But. His book is uh, quite a uh, uh, expose of all the thoughts that go through people's minds and all the different characters you have when you're at war that you fight with and against. And uh, I, that, was, that was the best thing we ever did. And other than that, they were pretty simple little prompts. You know, we never ask anybody in our group to write about war. And when we recruit, we do not say do you have a problem with war have you had did, you know did you kill somebody you or you were looking right in their eyes even though he was the enemy or did you accidentally shoot your friend uh, uh or how do you feel about how you got there anyway and tell us let's talk about uh um betrayal you know all the way from the top to the bottom and, and that's my big thing right now but at any rate um um we, we never ask anybody to write about war. And we have people that, that are new in our group and they're all excited. They get in there and they're there for two or three months and they haven't written anything yet. Then we have people who have written about their childhood or some story uh, that that's, they thought was important that hap happened to them. And then all of a sudden, after a year or two, they've written a war story. And you wonder what, uh, what, uh, what, tip that in their mind to do that. Maybe it's because they felt safer than they had, you know, as, as time went on, they felt safer and know they weren't going to get any con condemnation. And as far as uh, um, um, what Ron, Ron was talking about, I mentioned that our very first um, uh, veteran writers group at the World War I Museum, which we are lucky to have here in Kansas City, it's a great place to have meetings and it's a great place to get inspired. But um, um, we, um, we, we had a lot of people there, people we didn't know and didn't see, but we, uh, two or three of us that have been around and were, and were veterans were observing people that weren't acting <laughs> right. You know, they were shuffling and, and moving around and getting up and leaving and coming back, or they maybe shed a tear or two from something somebody had read. and. Uh, we don't, we pretty much, and when that happens, exclude those people from memberships in our, in our group. Because we, we, if they ask why, we tell them that we can fix them up with a writing group at the VA hospital because they need to be in a room there with a psychologist or a psychiatrist monitoring the group. We don't, even though I'm a physician, we have another medical person in our group, we don't pretend, as Ron said, to deal with that kind of thing in our, in our in our uh, monthly meetings. Now we do have some people that have had really severe moral trauma and, and about five over the years. And one other person and myself have, have at their request met them for lunch once or twice a month. And we talk about what they wanna talk about, you know, and we ask them, you know, if you want, if you want to get down to brass tacks on it, why don't you write a short poem about it? And throughout the things, you know, go ahead and uh, work on, um, on revision and that'll help. 
you know, I said in my little short piece I read that that once you learn to write uh, syntactically and clearly and with and uh, you then you kind of learn to think because a lot of people have trouble not being able to put their thoughts together, but writing makes you do that. Mm -hmm. And I think they get some clarity from that. And I know I did, and I know my friend who has, has the DSC did. And uh, um, we were sort of a two-man therapy therapeutic writing group, but we're both doctors and he's a dermatologist and I'm an intern, so that doesn't mean anything, you know? <laughs> so if we had a skin problem or heart attack, we, but as far as these, um, these wounds of moral injury from war, we had them, and he certainly had them in 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 ten out of ten way. But uh, we knew that it worked, and uh, I think um, being a physician in a group like that, like we have here, has been helpful too in in ways that that uh, I was telling him about what we're doing here, and he said, "Well, you know, the fact that you're a veteran and, and we're being in Vietnam, and you." So, you know, treat a lot of people that were dying and so forth. Um, don't discount that in your writing group. If you have a writer who's also a physician and also was a medical doctor in Vietnam. And I find that many of the poems and short stories that I've been writing lately come from that. And they're all therapeutic for me. Uh, so you know, actually, all, right, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it's just an ongoing thing. I, 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 I think part of what you're, if I hear you correctly, that um, writing about this experience has been, um, and, and as you said, if you can if you can put it in words, it sounds like it gives you. Um, I, I may be wrong about this, but uh, a, a little distance on it, or some sense of control about it. But it also helps you articulate it, look at it. I I think all of that. Okay. Because you put it at a distance to do that, you have right. to do, it or you can't get it done. But that right. that opens up your mind to be able to see things you could never see when you're all, in, you know, when you're working from your amygdala and hypothalamus and all that kind well, of stuff. Yeah, I I'm interested. Um, I said you're in a group, as I understand it, where it's not necessarily family, but it could be friends. Yes, yes, we we have uh, veterans and non-veterans, and it mm -hmm. works pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it works well. Uh, you, I know, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Go ahead. No, that uh, the one person in our group, she I think she teaches Tai Chi or something like that. Another person does photography, whatever. And then you have some writers, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it works well. I mean, as I said, I'm, you know, I'm a student. So I'm constantly right. trying to just learn different ways of putting things together, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I like just talking to people with from different backgrounds and so on. So it works well that way for me, you know. You know, I'm wondering whether um, it was um, very powerful for me for, for you to articulate not your, you, you were not, a, you're not a combat veteran, but you're certainly a veteran. Yes. And both in the military um, and in the reserves. Yes. And I appreciated the way you articulated the receptive moral injury of racism. Mm -hmm. in the military and, yes. and in the reserves as, um, as you've uh, described it. And I, I, I wonder um, if, if you, how you would say that has um, been of use to you um, uh, living in, uh, as a black man living in the, uh, in the United States and experiencing that uh, in, the, okay. in the military where you were, um, you know, where you had signed up to give service. Well, you mentioned that. The, the only time that I felt that I was at America is when I was out of the United States of America. Hmm. And I'll be brief here. Uh, and when uh, I went over to uh, Germany, Ramstad Air Force Base a long time ago, uh, 1978 or something like that. And uh, we had gone to this one town. I don't remember which town it was, village it was. And so it was four dog handlers together. You know, I'm, I was at, in the narcotics. And I was over there for Operation Counter Push, a big operation over there. And so we went out on the town someplace and uh, we're sitting in, the, in this restaurant and two white guys, two black guys. And so then no one came over to serve us. And so for some reason, the black guy, Reggie, he kind of started fidgeting and I was kind of doing the same thing. 
And then one of the white guys who was like, I guess he was like the leader, I guess he decided to leave. And he says, oh, I can't believe this. They won't serve us because you guys are black. He said, Major D, come over here, come over here. And the person came over and said, I can't believe you won't serve us because I have my black friends here. And he says, no, I won't serve you because you're Americans. Get out of my damn place. And he kicked us all out. And so we go out and, and I'm, I have a smile on my face. I'm, I'm feeling good, you know, because I'm like, wow, we got kicked out together, <laughs> you know? And I come from, from down south on the tail end of Jim Crow. So that was very, very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember being over in, um, in Istanbul, Turkey, I was uh, with a colleague, former colleague of mine at Widener University, psychologist. And uh, we got kicked out of a place there too, <laughs> uh, from a rug deal in, in uh, Istanbul. And then uh, from there, we, we went to Athens, Greece and went to um, Switzerland. And I'm sitting there with all these Europeans and I just didn't feel, I didn't feel the burden of race. I didn't feel it until I came back to America. I felt it when I came back, readily when I came back. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's not so much that, you know, when people look at race, they think, oh, those are all those racist people or whatever. You know, race is more messy and complicated than that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been oppressed by people high up that were black, you know, it has not much to do with that. I mean, if they, particularly if you mix up class, mix that with class. And so if you, you get this kind of fruitful dynamic going on where you got to have race, class, gender, and as a person, an enlisted person, or say someone trying to get a degree or someone trying to make it through academia or whatever, you know, race comes up. And I've seen, for example, black people, even at the, I hate to say it, what humanities form, uh, this one black person, you know, use race against me, you know, because it was more political than anything else, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and I, God, Jesus, I remember being in high school when uh, I had the highest grade in the English class and, and the teacher uh, docked my grade from a, an A to a, to a C. And I said, why did you do that? She said, because one day you had your book and I was showing a film and, but I put the book right, as soon as she saw me, I put it away because I was really was looking at my chemistry work that I had to finish. So I put it away, but she docked me two grades. And so, uh, you know, when I got the opportunity though, to say teach at on the university level, I would tell that story that, that if I did what she did, then I would be a, a flaming racist. The idea that a black person can't be a racist is, to me is asinine. Right. You know, so it's very complicated. It is. So race is just so messy. It's part of, it's, 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 it's like American pie, I guess, Cadillac and Chevrolet. So that's how I look at it. Well, I, I think part of what was helpful is that you articulated the way you experienced racism in the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that it's an experience of receptive moral injury in this uh, in that regard. And I, I appreciate your naming it. Let me I, just say, I'm sorry. I just want to say one more thing. When, uh, when I was in the recruiter for the Delaware Army National Guard, we would put we had a mission of maybe three or four recruits a month. And so we always made mission. And that year I was rookie of the year or something like this. We always did good. But we would put them in and they would get out through the, go out through the back door. The attrition rate was high. And all these, you know, they would be excited about joining the National Guard. I was, I guess, the perfect salesman. I would tell them how great the National Guard is, and how, you know, you can use it to your advantage the whole bit. And these people were, they were not surviving. And so I had to, to say to myself, you know, since so you're kind of lying to them, and it's not the truth, you know, and they didn't do anything about it. And I was told, look, just shut up. If you don't like what's going on here, then you can get out. So I shut my mouth, I shut up, I shut up. And then I, I see those guys, you know, eight, 10, you know, 18, 20 years later, and their careers are just totally messed over, you know, uh, because of that. And so yeah. I, I have, I still feel pain from that actually. Sure, sure. Because I'm doing something, in other words, like America's great, America's beautiful. Yes, it is, it's all that, you know. But on the other hand though, I have gotta deal with the race, class and gender here. And this is my experience also. So for my experience, yeah, I have that kind of pain, but I still must say though, that's why I finished with the last poem. I have to just really talk about God and love because I, I, I do believe like Dr. King that love conquers all. I'm still strugg struggling, we're still waiting for that to come, but I still believe that, I believe that. I love my enemies. <laughs> so. I wonder if you all could talk about 
um, the ways family members um, find these groups helpful and if you see any differences in the ways that they participate. And in your case, um, Sid, I think they're also friends or folks that were part of the uh, veterans work group. But how, what, what dynamic does that add to the group? Family? Yeah, to have family or friends um, in the, for example, HC in your group, you have veterans and you also invite family members of veterans. What, what dynamic does that bring? Well, I mean, bring, uh, if they're mothers, <laughs> you, we see the, most of the family members we have are mothers. We've had a couple of fathers that didn't last very long, mm -hmm. which, is very, which is just what you're speaking to. And I think the mothers come from, from a much more caring, uh, you know, they're very emotional about it. But then they kind of settle down and, and write. But but they they their fathers tend to be testosterone, -y, you know, kick butt, you know, get rid of those people that we've uh, dehumanized. You know, they they stay in that mode. Men stay in, like to be in that mode. It's a, it's a good mode to be in if you don't want to if you don't want to have to think you're wrong about something. You know? And that carries over with the fathers as well. And of course, a lot of the fathers are World War II and Korean mm -hmm. vets. So, well, now Vietnam vets as well. But uh, I think the mothers are fun to have because they look at everything in, in more, just like God would look at, just like she would, would look at. <laughs> you know, this mother thing is way better to deal with than this father thing. Because oh. that would be the biggest, biggest and, and most dramatic difference. And everything's positive with, with the mothers and daughters. We have a couple of daughters as well. They just look, look at it from a more loving aspect and trying to work some things out in that regard. I bet Ron has some. Yeah, I wanted to hear, Ron, what, what your experience is with including family. Well, we do, um, since, since we started the, the, the better drive. You lean project, towards your mic. Sure. Since we started the writing project, um, we've always invited family members. I'm, I, I, I think their, their stories are just as important as the veteran stories. Um, and, you know, I, I grew up in a military family. Both of my parents grew up in military families. Um, I'm in a military family now. So uh, I understand what it's like to see your dad go off to war. I understand what it's like to be the dad or not the dad, but the husband who goes off to war. I, in our experience with the creative writing project, um, the family members have been, I would say mostly spouses and children of veterans. Um, the expressive writing program, we had some spouses show up because we also, you know, we did the, the clinical work and then we would all go downstairs and just have like a creative writing workshop to talk about writing and spouses could come to that. Um, one of the great values, Nancy, since you were asking about the value of having them in the room, I'll just tell you a, a, a brief story. Please. We've been running workshops with the Dare County, North Carolina Arts Commission for eight years, nine years now. Every um, Veterans Day, we go down and run a workshop with them. So we're getting to know the people in Dare County. Um, very early on, we had a guy come in named Bobby, who was a Vietnam veteran um and very troubled and he sat in the very back of the room sort of went into you know briefcase defile just you know hiding behind his paperwork the whole time and there was a woman sitting next to him who didn't introduce herself as his spouse his wife she just said you know my name's mary or whatever and bobby didn't say a word for the first morning he didn't say a word other than i'm bobby i was in vietnam i, I was in the army in vietnam that's all he said and then nothing else, and then nothing else for the first afternoon. And then about three hours into the first morning, right before lunch, he just opens up and talked for three, four, five minutes. And by the time he's done, he's crying, I'm crying, everybody in the room's crying. And um, his wife 
just sort of turns her head and she's looking at him. And then she looks at me and she goes, I've been married to this guy for 30 years. I've never heard any of this. Hmm. So what we felt, what I felt like then was that we had created a space that Bobby felt safe. And he felt like he could then tell these stories about his experience. And he could then talk, he could become vulnerable in front of this group of veterans, you know, and the veterans standing at the front of the room, veterans and family members sitting all around. But, you know, Bobby died of an Agent Orange related cancer a few years later, but he was able to actually get some of the plays that he wrote uh, presented on stage before he died. And very cool. So the, the value to, the, to his wife was she got to hear these stories and she got to see his work presented publicly. Um, and that, cool. That's just one story. So. Yeah. But I hear the contrast with HC in, in your group, that kind of um, emotion would have led you to ask, um, is it Bill, Bobby, Billy, Bobby, Bobby, not to come back. Whereas- well, we, did, we never had that situation. But you were saying if somebody teared up or something like that, then you would talk with them and ask them to leave no, or not I to come back. No, oh, I sorry, please clarify. Tearing up in body language, negative body language is totally different. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we were we were talking about people we had seen for the first time. They weren't even members of our group, and they were at the large one of the large fall conferences, uh -huh. and uh, they were obviously going to be trouble in the group. And we we try we don't want to give people psychological tests to be in our writers sure. group. But that's why we require them to come to a fall conference, which are big conferences. And believe me, there are two or three of us that are watching people and we know danger signals and people that, that we probably don't want in the group. And we've missed a few and we've had them get up and stomp out, you know. But this woman that Ron's talking about, talking about I think she, she had a feeling that would happen with her husband and she came because of that. And um, I, I, she just needed some help to get him to do that. So, and I'm really help, I'm really glad I asked you this question because I did misunderstand you, and maybe some others did too. So, someone like this man would not have been a what he shared wouldn't have been a cause for exclusion. Not well. <laughs> you know, this man probably needs some some therapy. We don't give therapy in writing. Of course, right. Okay, so we don't ask for. You know, we we have had veterans who have been on therapy several mm -hmm. on therapy at the VA some and some that fail to come to their meeting because they can't start the ignition in their car when they blow into their breathalyzer you know but and we see them even outside of that and they're usually people that are smart and pretty good writers you know so they're so they're trying you know they're trying to get something done that they can't get at their VA therapy, mm -hmm. but they need both. And we've had no I I'm sorry I, if you misunderstood we we I was talking about people that seem pathologic. I that see, we think for the first time ever in one of these meetings, that's what I said, we require they come to one of these big meetings and believe me, we're looking at them, hoping they're gonna be fine, but if they show some anger or something like that, we might ask them not to come unless they're under in, in therapy. Okay. Yeah, and certainly crying or tearing up is not a reason that we'd ask them not to come because we do that a lot. Right, right. Yeah. Sid, in your group, it's not family, but if I understand correctly, but friends right. or others uh, that have yes, joined uh, the work group. What what does that civilian. add to your group? Um, well, it's well, and one in particular, a friend of mine, and I've actually known him for years. I brought him into the group, but we've been writing since God, since the 1990s, maybe. And then he went away, but he continued to write. And then I convinced him to join our group. And his writing style is different than mine. And he's a, a I've known the family. Uh, he acts a lot that way. He's a very, calm, you know, calm. He's a calming spirit for me, that's for sure. He's, you know, he's into the words. Tracy Cooper, he's into the word, the whole bit. He's a prolific writer. And he, he uh, Tom, our, uh, I, I guess I can say general if I just don't offend anyone, but uh, he allows us to, you know, if you write a poem or something or you've written something, you want to share it, 
uh, then you can, at the next meeting or whatever, you know, he even put it in the report that Sid Jacobs was going to recite or read or whatever, or Tracy Cooper, whomever, you know, and uh, it works, you know, and, and again, uh, because I know my friend's style and I know what he adds, that's why I recommend to Tom and others that he uh, join the group. But then of course, there are other civilians in the group also. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I, I love war stories, but also love civilian stories because I'm, again, I'm somewhere in between, you know, so sure. uh, even though I've come full circle though, I must say I've, I've come full circle, you know. Each of the three of you are published authors, and I'm interested. And, and each of you has included in your writing aspects of your war experience, um, or your experience of moral injury. I mean, your experience of military service, whether in combat or not. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about for the folks that are listening and will listen in the future when this is on a link? A, a link. What is it about? publishing your work you know, or hearing your own voice if you are you know reciting your poetry for example um, somewhere else what is it that is um, um, helpful for you uh, in, in this in this journey um, that um, military service has contributed to for you I'm waiting on Ron to answer that. One. I think he's waiting on you. Why are you picking on me, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, when I got out of the military at the end of 2008, I immediately enrolled in the graduate writing program at Johns Hopkins. Um, while I was in that program, I was using my GI Bill benefits, and there were sort of two tracks going on. One. I was using that program as a way of getting control of my trauma. I was bringing in to workshop at Hopkins, these just pages and pages of um, stream of consciousness scenes. Um, no punctuation, <laughs> you know, just profanity lace. This is, this is what I need to get out of me. And I, I, I ended up in one class like apologizing to my classmate. So I, that's one track that I'm using it for. And it was hugely helpful because one, again, once I got that, those memories out of my head and onto the page, I felt like I could control them more. The second was I figured out that, you know, I was using our tax dollars to get a degree in writing, you know, woo, you know, you're going to be a better writer. And, and, and what are you going to do with that? Why, what's the value? To that and when i was driving home one night from class this idea came to me to give it away and i sat and talked with my wife and over about a week we came up with this idea of creating a writing project um to give away what i had learned i was writing for time magazine and all these other places as a professional writer and as a veteran and someone who had a graduate writing degree and i could just give all that away for free we came up with a vehicle and did that the third track of this was that I'd been medevaced home from my second tour in Darfur after failed suicide attempt. And I know what, what kept me from asking for help was the fear of losing my security clearance. I was an Intel officer, the fear of being mocked, the fear of not being able to do my job anymore. You know, like I, I, I was good at my job. I liked it. I was, you know, Kosovo, Rwanda, Afghanistan, Iraq, Darfur, all these places, I, I was the guy on the ground writing those reports. And I was afraid to ask for help. And mm -hmm. the result was that I, I, I was ready to end my life. Um, telling my story in a memoir, and it started off as a series of essays. Uh, the very first time I came out about that was in a, a peer reviewed medical policy journal and you know the the first notes i got back from people was i had no idea how did you hide that from us I'm like, you trained me to hide things from people you know it's my job but if i could reach one person who was afraid to ask for help it would have all been worthwhile and so the value of getting my my book published my memoir mm -hmm. Uh, it's called Seriously Not All Right, Five Wars in Ten Years. 
um, if I could get that published and one person read it and said, I can get help, I'll be all right, then it's all worthwhile. So I had these three sort of this triangle of ideas that I was working on, helping myself, giving away what I knew, and hopefully using that one story of driving out into the desert with a borrowed uh, nine mil um, and surviving it because the phone rang and pulled me back. Um, it, it would have all, all been worthwhile. Well, what you said at the last is the reason I write. And listening to you go through all, all of that even helped me believe that more. But I think when I went, when you go to war as a physician, you go in a totally different, you're looking at everything totally different. I've had my hands inside of somebody's belly or somebody's skull before, you know, doing autopsies. Okay. So that wasn't a big deal for me, except here's a young guy that this surely didn't have to happen to. And I think my writing as I've gone on and on my own, my own writing and, and um, has been as what I uh, feel is I'm a kind of warning to people who have been to war or people that are thinking about going to war, or even people who live in this environment where we live in and we're threatened by war every, we don't know when a missile is gonna come at us from Russia right now, you know. And uh, with all the people that are angry in this country um, to um, um, help them understand that, I told Nancy I wouldn't do this, but, uh, to help them understand that it's not their fault that they went to war, for God's sake. They would, I mean, for instance, my, I'll just tell you about Vietnam because I, I, I am certain I'm right about Vietnam. It was betrayal from the beginning to the end. When I go to that wall, there's 68,300 and some names there, and every one of them were betrayed. And I understand that. I know that's true. When I touch the wall and see my friends' names there, and I touch their names, I know it's true. And it's not a, not like the Second World War. When you go over there to that memorial, it's totally different. We had to do that. That was something we had to do or we would not be here at this point. But Vietnam uh, was a war uh, that a president started, another president carried it on, and it was a war based on lies. And we were killing civilians right and left. And in the meantime, we got 58,000 of our own killed for no reason, zero reason. And, I, and my poetry is that kind of poetry that you realize we've been screwed. You know, we've, and the, the wall poetry, especially. But uh, I, I think that's my, probably my mission from, from the very first poem I wrote. Mm -hmm because it was about being uh, um, one of the first ones. It was about being at the wall and, and uh, uh, my friend and I were there at the wall and some couple of standing behind us, it's January for God's sake, the wind's blowing, it's cold. There weren't 10 people at the wall and they were standing there. And I said to my friend, I said, look, I think we're at the panel they wanna be at. You know, We need to move now, we've been here for 15 minutes. And I turned to the lady and said, Oh, do you have someone here? We'll, we'll leave. I said, do you have someone here? And she said, no, just the two of you. You know, so when that happened, I knew I didn't know for two or three years that was a poem. <laughs> right. But, um, but that's, that's the kind of stuff I want to write about. I want to write to make people really mad that we've been to war. I, I, want, I want to stop it. I want, we, we just need to find a way not to be, not to, we need to get rid of all, you know, all this betrayal. You know, Achilles was betrayed by Agamemnon and he went on a rage, on a rant, you know, and, and is nothing has changed. Yeah. And uh, we, we just, no more war. That's what I write on my books when I sign them. No more war, you know? And yeah. so that's why I write, Nancy. I mean, that that's, uh, and being with you guys here has kind of clarified that for me. I knew it. Because every time I write a poem, if it's anti-war, I put the period and I say, right. that's another one, you know? Right. Yeah, so that's what I don't, I don't write for, for a, a personal therapy or, or that kind of thing. And, and I think it's a good reason to write. 
Yep. Let me make sure Sid gets a chance to say something about this because we're very close to the end of our time. And what was your question again now, please? I'm trying to Next. remember. It was, how is it that participating in these writing groups Publishing. is helpful to your experience of dealing with um, moral injury? Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, well, for me, it's a, it's a, a sweet release for me, okay? Mm -hmm. Just to be able to get it out. And again, I think I had a lot of stuff in, as I said, when I came back home, uh, my family didn't think that I had done much, thought I had been off to the job course someplace because I quit college, number one, and you know went to the military. So for 10 years, I, I got no recognition, no recognition. Uh, and then, but again, going into academia, I was able to publish and do uh, you know academic work, publish that way. Uh, right. some, academic articles, whatever. Uh, I went to, uh, you know, Athens, Greece, spoke about black males and religion, going to prison, that sort of thing. Right. But when I published freedom poems, though, I felt like I was giving something back to society and giving something back to God. And it that's was just- that helpful. Awesome. That's a helpful theme. And um, we are just a little bit past the time. So I, I want to close by thanking you for sharing in the ways that you have deeply from your own experience and also sharing what you've learned. And clearly the folks that are with us uh, for this webinar and we'll watch it in the future, they were eager to learn and to take this learning. And one of the things I've seen in veterans is wanting to give back. Yes. And it's clear that part of what you all have been doing is wanting to give back as well as to deal with your own story. I wanna thank you so much for um, providing this resource uh, for Thank others you. to use. Thank and you. I wish you well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to everybody. Thank you.